Hey everyone, this is Paul Kegabine at the Garland County Library, and tonight I'm here with a special guest, Terry Diggs. By day, he's an attorney here in Hot Springs, but the rest of the time, he's a teller of folk stories and singer of folk songs of the Washita Mountains, which is what he's here to share with you this evening. So Mr. Diggs has prepared several stories and anecdotes that are part of the Washita Mountains folklore, and I know he's got at least one spooky one just in time for Halloween, and maybe he'll sprinkle in a song or two here and there. But uh, I just want to let the audience know if you have any questions or comments whatsoever, please ask them in the comment section, and towards the end, I'll be able to ask them for Mr. Diggs here. All right, so Mr. Diggs, I know you're a lawyer, and you can probably talk forever, so I just want to give you plenty of time to do so, but you wanted to start us off with a song, so I'm going to let you introduce that song and take it away. All right. I dreamed a dream the other night, I dreamed that I could fly. I flopped my wings like a buzzard and I flew up in the sky. St. Peter asked me where I was from and what I had to eat. I told him from old Arkansas and raised on turnip greens. Turnip greens, them good old turnip greens. Cornbread and buttermilk and them good old turnip greens. Yeah. So what was that song? Well, I call it turnip greens. It's just an old folk song I heard from an old lady growing up. And uh, it's about two things that we... Country people used to live on around here, cornbread and turnip greens. Excellent, excellent. All right, so we have some people tuning in. A uh, reminder, just if you have any questions or comments for Mr. Terry Diggs here, please post them in the comment section, and I'll be glad to ask them as soon as we get a chance. All right, so I'm going to let you begin with some stories here in a moment, but first of all, if you would start by letting the audience know what is the definition of folklore and what is it that makes it important. Well, folklore traditionally is songs and stories uh, that are passed on from mouth to ear, aren't written down in a book, aren't in the newspaper. They're stories that uh, just pass among the people. And of course, when that happens, they change. Uh, if you've ever played the game of gossip when you were in school, you know, where the teacher whispers one thing into one student's ear and it goes all the way through the students. By the time it gets to the other end, it's a lot different. Well, there's that's why nobody has the same folk song or folk story because they're modified a little. My Uncle William used to say you have to change things around a little so you can uh, remember them better. And so sometimes that happens. But folks, folklore in general is things that are passed from mouth to ear, from one person to another, and are not in a book or on the TV or anything like that. What are some of the common themes in folklore? Well, Folklore began when we were a more agricultural nation. And so there are a lot, there's a lot about farming. Uh, religion was more important perhaps than it is now. There's a lot of stories and songs that are religious in nature. The country store was a great meeting place. And there are a lot of stories and songs about the country store. Uh, food is important. You know, this song I just sang is turnip greens and cornbread. And so food is important. One thing you'll notice in folklore is and uh, Jimmy Driftwood was kind of a friend of mine, and he was a great Arkansas folklorist. He founded those Ark Folk Center. And Jimmy Driftwood would argue with people for hours that their version of a song wasn't right, that his version was right. And people tend to think that. They argue because they do change over time, and people add things and subtract things. So where did you learn your music and all of your stories from? My first real inspiration was an old lady out at Bonnerdale, Miss Ida Smith. She uh, was from Boonville, Arkansas, and she moved to Bonnerdale after as a young married person. She was never in, the, she lived to be 88, 89 years old. She never left the state of Arkansas in her life, and she never was in the city of Little Rock. I guess Hot Springs was the biggest town she was ever in, but she was a storehouse of folk songs and stories. She played the guitar and the harmonica and sang. Uh, she started me out. And then I had a couple of uncles that were next there, mainly my uncle William. He was a great storyteller and several of the stories I'll tell tonight, if I get time to, uh, came from my uncle William originally. So, so let's kind of tie this into uh, the Washita Mountains. Are, are there any themes that are specific to this region? 
No, probably not. The mountains of Arkansas, the Washtaws and the Ozarks, as well as the Appalachians are all kind of the same culture in many ways. And so we have a lot of the same stories and songs. We perhaps have lost more of them here in Arkansas than they have back in North Carolina, Virginia, that area. But there, there's a pretty common theme. There are some stories and in, in some that I may tell tonight that uh, really are particular uh, indigenous to Arkansas. But, uh, and there are, there are differences. You know, there are differences. One of the things I've studied a lot is dialect. And uh, there are ways of saying things in the Washita Mountains that you don't even hear in the flatlands of Arkansas. Uh, I used to spend time with cousins in Mississippi, South Mississippi, and they said, go out on the porch and bring in some fat lightered. Well, I had no idea what that was. And I learned that it's the thing in Arkansas we call rich pine or fat pine, you know, but it's something to start the fire with. And so there's a lot of, these differences are passing away. In the flatlands of Arkansas, they say y'all a lot. The old folks when I was growing up never said y'all. The word in the mountains for the plural of you, it was Ewans. What are Ewans doing today? You know, never said y'all. But so things change and unfortunately we're all becoming very homogenized, I'm afraid. All right, so I'll go ahead and let you begin with any story of your choice uh, and I'll come back and see if we have any questions. Once you're done with that, give me the key. Well, one time years ago, the boys were sitting around the Bonnardale store talking, telling stories, and they were talking about how the old Mincer place was hated. You know, old Uncle Tom Mincer, he was murdered and his blood spattered across the wall. And some folks said that every year on the same day he was murdered, the spots of blood on the wall would turn bright red again. And they said it was sure hated. There was all kind of haints living there. And uh, <clears throat> Uncle Cicero was there. And Uncle Cicero, he liked to pretend he knew everything. And he said, well, I ain't afraid of no haints. I'll go up there. I'm not afraid to go in that house. And they said, well, here's a $5 bill if you'll go and spend the night in the old Mincer place. And Uncle Cicero said, well, I'll do it. And so that night, it, it happened to be a kind of a bright moonlit night. He thought that might be a little better. And he took his old shotgun and a bedroll and he walked up there towards the old house and the closer he got, the gloomier it looked. It was full of shatters, you know, and he walked up on the porch and those old porch boards just creaked with every step. And he got up to the front door and he reached out for the front door and it had a spider web and some slick on it, you know. But he went ahead, he, he was beginning to get a little like he might have been into something he didn't want to. But he decided he'd go through with it. So he opened the door and he stepped across the living room, his darkest pitch in there. So he went and he saw the ladder that went up into the loft and he thought, well, if there is haints, probably I'd be safer up in the loft than anywhere else. And so he climbed up that ladder real slow and careful and he looked around him, you know, and he got up to the top of the ladder in the loft and he looked and over here to the right side over in the corner, there wasn't nothing. So he leaned back the other way and looked over the left side over in the corner and there wasn't nothing there neither. So he went on ahead and climbed into the loft and he spread out his bedroll in front of the window in the loft. And he laid down there with his shotgun laying right beside him, just in case. Because to tell you the truth, he's beginning to get a little scared. And so he went, he finally, after laying there a long time, Uncle Cicero went to sleep. And finally he went to sleep and slept a while. But after a while he woke up and he knew something had woke him up. And whatever it was, his freight is right there in the room with him. So real slow and careful, he eased up from his pallet on the floor and he looked over into the right hand, left hand corner of the loft. And there in the left hand corner, there wasn't nothing. So he looked over in the right hand corner of the loft and over in the right hand corner, there wasn't nothing. So real slow and careful, like he lifted his head up and he looked down toward his feet and then he seen it, two big old bright, white haint eyeballs just a shining at him in the dark and so real slow he reached over and grabbed his shotgun and pulled back and kablam kablam shot both of his big toes off that's what he had seen uh, uh, glaring in the light in the in the dark the moon is shining on him i guess he didn't go back to the mincer house anymore and that's the story i call the haint story you know what a haint is paul ghost it's a ghost that's right 
what country people call the goat. I know that because you told me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> How about a song? Let's hear it. All right. <clears throat> Let me get my fingers on the right strings here. I wish I was single again, oh then, I wish I was single again, cause when I was single my pockets did jingle and I wish I was single again, I married me a wife, oh then, oh then, I married me a wife, oh then. I married me a wife, she's the pain of my life, and I wish I was single again. She beat me and banged me, oh then, oh then. She beat me and banged me, oh then. She beat me and banged me and swore she would hang me, and I wish I was single again. The rope it did break, oh then, oh then. The rope it did break, oh then. The rope it did break and I made my escape. I wish I was single again. Then one day she died, oh then, oh then. Then one day she died, oh then. Then one day she died and I laughed till I cried. I was glad to be single again. I married me another, oh then, oh then. I married me another, oh then. I married me another, she's the devil's grandmother and I wish I was single again. <clears throat> So young men take warning, oh then, oh then. Young men take warning, oh then. Be kind to the first, for the last is much worse, and you'll wish you was single again. How's your wife feel about that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't really asked directly. <laughs> um, is romance or, or lack thereof a big theme it is a pretty good thing uh thwarted love you know that's a big thing too uh falling in love and something happened you can't go through with it and uh a lot of times somebody dies my grandmother said one time that you know if nobody dies in a song it ain't hardly worth singing and uh, a lot of songs like uh, the wreck of old 97 and and different other kind of semi-folk songs where a tragedy takes away the loved one, you know. So that's a, that's a common theme too. Well, on that note, do you have any short love stories to share, <laughs> or, or love tragedies? I don't know that I have any short love stories to share. There are some, um, but uh, I don't know what would be good that would go along with that. I've got a lot of stories about animals. That's a common theme too. Uh, one of my favorite, and this, this my uncle told me, this is a, a Garland County story actually. But uh, <clears throat> one time there's a lot of chicken thieves around our part of the country. I'm from Bonnerdale, which is on the corner of Garland, Montgomery, and Hot Spring counties. But anyway, all our whole area from, from Hemp Wallace to the Oklahoma line, there was just a lot of chicken thieves during the depression. And so uh, I tell this story, by the way, as if I were my uncle, because it's, it's, he told it to me. But anyway, they, everybody's getting their chickens stolen. And some of them really, these chicken thieves really got bold. At Ms. Lou Roberts' house at Hemp Wallace, they left a note. On, they stole all of her chickens but two. And they left a note on the door that said, we left a Rhode Island rooster and a Dominecker hen. Raise us some more because we're coming again. Well, <clears throat> wasn't too long after that that, we had a little thunderstorm. This was the hot summertime, and we had a little thunderstorm out at Bonnerdale. And you know, Mama, anybody that knew Mama, she was just real scared of thunder and lightning. So she was up and watching and everything. And directly, she come woke Pop up and said, "Andrew, there's somebody out here at the road, right in front of our house. A car out there with people in it." 
And so old grandpa got up, papa got up and he come and got me because I was the oldest boy, you know, and brought me out there. And the house we lived in, the old Dolan place, it had a L-shaped front porch. And so we got in the center of that L, so we were kind of in the dark. But we could look out there and a bright flash of lightning come on. We seen that car out there and we seen three men coming across the field towards the chicken house. And I said, Papa, shoot him. He had brought his gun out there. Old Bessie brought his gun out there. And I said, Papa, shoot him. They're coming to steal our chickens. And he said, no, son, let's, let's wait and see what they're going to do. So we waited a minute or two. Seemed like a long time, but I guess it wasn't. Because in a few minutes, another bright flash of lightning come. And we looked out there. And they were there at the chicken yard. And they, one of them was trying to climb over the fence around the chicken yard. And I said, Papa, they're going to steal our chickens. Give them, give them a blast of your shotgun. He said, no, no, let's see what they're going to do. Well, it was a while till we heard another uh uh, we saw another loud flash of lightning, and when we did, they were scattered all over the chicken house, running after chickens and uh, trying to catch them, you know, and, and going here and there. And I turned to Papa to tell him to shoot them, but it was too late because kablam, kablam, he gave them both barrels. Well, the next time there's a bright flash of lightning, we seen two of them was helping the third one walk across the field, going back to their car. And I said, Papa, let's go after them. Let's arrest them. And Papa said, no, I reckon they've learned their lesson. And so they walked off across the field and got in their car and drove off. Well, nothing happened on it for a week or so. About a week, we were going over to Uncle Curtis's. He lived on the other side of Big Mazarn, and we were taking him a plow or going to pick one up or something. And to cross Mazarn at that time, there wasn't no bridge. You had to wade across the water and come up on the high ground on the other side. And when we waded down into the water, there was old Doc Jennings sitting on the high ground on the other side of the creek. And so Papa goes up to him and says, hello, Doc. And Doc says, hello, Andrew. And Doc says, <clears throat> I hear you're treating someone for the pneumonia over here on the north side of Mazarn. And Doc says, yes, I am. I'm treating them for pneumonia. And Papa says, well, I want to know, are you treating them with these little red pills like you always give us when we're sick with something like that? And Doc Jennings knew what he was after. And he kind of laughed and he said, no, Andrew, this one I'm a treating with the tweezers, he said. Well, you know what? There wasn't any more chicken thieving that whole year out at Monterdale because I think Papa taught them a lesson. That's the story of the chicken thieves. <clears throat> so uh, one thing that's stood out to me is, uh, you know, that I, I hear, you know, that the shotgun gets the nickname Old Desi and you hear that about a lot of inanimate objects. What's the... The reasoning behind that. Well, I think that's what Grandpa did call his shotgun was Old Bessie, and I think that was pretty common. I seems like I've read that Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone or one of them, their shotgun they named Old Bessie, and I think that kind of spread from there, you know. So, do we have any uh, local major figures kind of like Davy Crockett in Washington? Well, not that I've heard of. There were certainly some interesting figures around this area and figures that did unusual things. Uh, of course, the outlaw Jesse James supposed to have robbed the stage here just outside of Hot Springs, and it's one of the few robberies that they are pretty sure they can trace back to Jesse James because uh, years later when he died, was killed, Robert Ford shot him, uh, they found a uh, gold watch on Jesse James' body that had belonged to someone that was robbed on that stagecoach outside of Hot Springs. And so we know Jesse James. Jesse James, by the way, was a big hero uh, to my people. My grandmother thought he hung the moon, you know, robbed the rich, gave to the poor. And I have a song about it. You want to hear a little of that? Of course. Jesse James was a lad who killed many a man. He robbed the Glendale train. He stole from the rich and he gave to the poor. He had a hand and the heart and the brain. Poor Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Three children, they were brave. But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard has laid Jesse James in his grave. Jesse James was a lad who killed many a man. He robbed the Glendale train. He stole from the rich and he gave to the poor. He had a hand and the heart and the brain. Poor Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Three children, they were brave. But that
says he was a man a friend to the poor he ne'er would see a man suffer pain and with his brother frank he robbed the glatton bank and stopped the glendale train poor jesse had a wife to mourn for his life three children they were brave but that dirty little coward that shot mr howard has laid jesse james in his grave i love this last verse it kind of proves that if you don't toot your own horn it may not get tooted this song was made by Billy Gashade as soon as the news did arrive. He said there was no man with the law in his hand that could take Jesse James while alive. Poor Jesse had a wife to mourn for his life. Three children, they were brave. But that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard has laid Jesse James in his grave. By the way, that Mr. Howard, that was a made up name that Jesse James was living under in St. Joseph, Missouri, whenever he was killed. Another connection with Hot Springs is Jesse's brother, Frank James, supposed to have worked in McLeod's Happy Hollow, which was kind of an amusement park where the Happy Hollow Spring is now. And Frank James was supposed to have spent some time in Hot Springs and working there, Jesse's brother. Not sure if that's true or not, but anyway. So they were kind of Robin Hood figures in the local mm -hmm. folklore. They were big heroes to a lot of folks. So I noticed uh, being, growing up poor is kind of a recurring theme and, and probably a lot of the culture wouldn't exist without it. Can you kind of expand upon that a little bit? Oh, yeah. We were all poor. Everybody was poor, even when I was young. And it was worse than that, you know, before I was. The one thing about it was everybody had a garden. Everybody raised chickens. So you always had chicken and eggs and garden vegetables to eat. Every once in a while, you get your hand on, on a pig and kill a pig. And uh, but, uh, yeah, being poor was just a fact of life. Eudora Welty did a picture book that she took for the WPA in Mississippi in the 30s. And she said uh, in the depression and she said in the introduction to that said that uh, uh, poverty was not really much of a difference in life for people that were already living in the poorest state in the country. And Arkansas wasn't much richer than Mississippi in the depression. Well, do you want to hear about my Uncle William's goat? Love to. All right. <clears throat> Uncle William had a little goat and it was kind of a pet. He'd give it anything it wanted. It, it was just his pet. And uh, it followed him around everywhere he went. And Uncle William lived in a little cabin out in the woods behind Grandma's house. And I was staying up at Grandma's house one time. And Grandma was boiling clothes. For years after everybody else quit, Grandma would have a wash pot going in the corner and fire under it and boiling water to wash her clothes with. And I don't know if you know this about the old country women, but most of them, boy, they didn't want a bit of grass to grow in their yard. They got out there with a hole and they hold up that grass. They might plant some flowers, but they didn't want no grass because it would hide snakes and ticks and chiggers. And so grandma's yard was flat as could be and hard packed dirt and didn't have any grass in it. And for that reason, Uncle William would bring his car up there to work on. He had an old Chevrolet car. He had to tear down, put back together about once a month seemed like, and he'd bring it up to grandma's house and take it apart and spread it all over her yard. And he uh, had done that one day when I was up there, grandma was washing clothes and Uncle William had his car there working on and he drained the gas out into a little tank there on the side of the yard. And he was under the car working on something. And about that time, his little goat showed up. And so his goat come up there and started sniffing around Uncle William and pawing at him, you know, trying to get him to pay her some attention, and he wouldn't do it. He'd just shoot her off, and well, she looked around. She wasn't interested in me, but she came over to that trough where he had drained the gasoline out of that car. She started sniffing of it. The first news I know, she bent over there and started licking on that gasoline. 
Well, you know, I thought maybe I ought to say something, but I was just a kid of a boy then, and it seemed like every time I said something, I got a whooping, so I didn't say a thing. I just watched it, but I knew I, I might ought to say something, but that goat drank of quite a bit of that gas and then started looking around, and looking back, I think she was looking for some grass to eat because that gas was probably kind of burning her mouth. Well, the only grass in Grandma's yard, there was a big twig of johnson grass growing right by one of the rocks there that was holding that wash pot up over the fire and this johnson grass was growing right there by that rock next to the fire well that goat headed over towards that grass because it's the only grass it was to eat and once again i thought well maybe i ought to say something about this you know but i thought again well every time i say something i get in trouble so i didn't say nothing and that goat went over there started eating on that johnson grass like it was good just ate it and ate it and ate it down further and directly leaned way on in to get that last little bit. And when she did, the flames come out from under that pot and lit her beard on fire. And oh, when her beard got on fire, she leaned back, reared back on her hind legs and opened her mouth like she was going to let out a big blade. And when she did, those flames shot down her mouth and kablam, that goat blowed up into a hundred pieces. I tell you, for days afterwards, we was finding piece of that goat behind the barn and on the roof of the house and all over. You know, a lot of people that I tell this story to don't much want to believe it. But if you want proof, you can ask my Uncle William because he had the biggest piece of that goat he could find, which was a little bit of her tail. He had it killed, dried and sugar cured and was wearing it as a watch fob. That's the story of the goat that blowed up. I'm a little skeptical myself. But we'll have to. They say you can tell somebody's lying if they say, and I've got the papers at home to prove it. <laughs> um, so speaking of the, the goat drinking gasoline, um, I guess probably alcohol, moonshine, and prohibition played a big role in the, the stories and the culture. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, Uncle William and a cousin of ours, uh, had a still together in the mountains in, in between Bonnerdale and Crystal Springs. Bonnerdale is on 70 and Crystal Springs on 270. And, and, and this cousin lived over on, close to 270 and Uncle William lived at Bonnerdale. And Uncle William would buy sugar and haul it across the mountains. To, well, up in the middle of the mountains is where their still was. I know the spot it was. He'd haul the sugar from one end and this cousin would bring the cornmeal from the other end. Because if you bought a lot of sugar and a lot of cornmeal, they were going to suspect you were making whiskey because those were the two main ingredients. But they bought it from different ends of the, of the area and nobody uh, supposedly figured out. Uncle William told me one time, one time he and I were out squirrel hunting. And I was about 15 years old and we came across a still out in the woods near Bonnerdale. And Uncle William said, now this is a still and it's a running. There was a fire going and there was the whiskey was dripping out of the boiler, you know. And, and uh, he said, now here's what you do. You do just like I do. Because that man that owns this still, he's hiding out in the woods with his shotgun. And so we come up and you stir the mash and get you a little drink of the beer that's, that's made. And then you, you go on. He won't bother you because he knows you've helped. And if you're a revenue, you ain't going to help make the whiskey. And so that way you're safe. And sure enough, that's what we did. And then we walked off and he didn't shoot us, didn't kill us. So moonshine was one of the few things you could sell back then. Uh, there were not much you could sell. I remember asking my mother, I was looking through some old mortgages. We'd mortgage our place to what's now the Bank of Amity. We started before the bank was even started. But anyway, they mortgaged the uh, cotton and the corn crop. And I said, why just cotton and corn? Why did everybody just grow cotton and corn? And not only that, Garland County is a terrible place to grow cotton. It's rocky and it's just not suitable for cotton. And she said, well, that's all you could sell. You could raise all kinds of other things, but there wasn't no market for them. So if your cash crops were cotton and corn and maybe moonshine whiskey. My Aunt Mabel said that when she is growing up, people always talk about making, making uh, women's clothes, petticoats or, or drawers out of flour sacks. She said, we never had flour sacks because Papa always made whiskey. So we had sugar sacks is what we, our clothes was made out of. Okay. How about another song? Do what? Let's hear another song. Another song. Well, this one I always sang, uh, this one I learned from uh, 
Uncle William, and it's one I always sing a cappella. Uh, I always call it when I come in the other night, but uh, Bill McNeil, who was head of the uh, Ozark Folk Center, he said his real name is The Cabbage Head, and you might see why when you hear all of it. <clears throat> when I come in the other night, a strange sight greeted me. I seen another man's horse in the soul where my horse ought to be. Now come here, little wifey, explain this thing to me. How come this other man's horse in the stall where my horse ought to be? You blind fool, you crazy fool, you drunk fool, can't you see that that is just a rocking chair your granny give to me? Well, I've roamed and rambled this wide world or 10,000 times or more, but saddles on a rocking chair I've never seen before. When I come in the other night, as drunk as I could be, I seen another man's coat on the rack where my coat ought to be. <clears throat> now come here, little wifey, explain this thing to me. How come this other man's coat on the rack where my coat ought to be? You blind fool, you crazy fool, you drunk fool, can't you see? That that is just an old bed quilt your granny give to me. Well, I've roamed and rambled this wide world or 10,000 times or more, but pockets on a bed quilt I have never seen before. Now, the last verse gets kind of serious, Paul. When I come in the other night as drunk as I could be, I seen another man's head in the bed where my head ought to be. Now come here, little wifey, explain this thing to me. How come this other man's head in the bed where my head ought to be? You blind fool, you crazy fool, you drunk fool, can't you see that that is just a cabbage head your granny give to me? Well, I've roamed and rambled this wide world or 10,000 times or more, but mustache on a cabbage head I've never seen before. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so what would you say that the legacy of Washita music is on kind of today's culture? outside of the Washington. Well, unfortunately, I don't think it has had much of a legacy. It's kind of dying out as are most regional cultures, regional ways of speaking. You know, Johnny Carson had the perfect Nebraska accent, and that has become the accent that news people and everybody uh, wants to speak now. Uh, we don't say Ewans anymore. We don't say clur instead of clear. Uh, like I do, I, I, it naturally comes to me to say clur. I don't know, and so they're they're the whole culture is kind of dying out, and it's been killed, I think, by television mainly. Uh, television and and music, the national music used to music was pretty local, and uh, Granny Riddle, Almeda Riddle, was a great folk musician from Greer's Ferry near Heber Springs, Arkansas, and they interviewed her one time about uh, music and what kind of music she liked. And they said, what do you think of Elvis Presley? And she said, well, Elvis has got a lot of talent, but you know, I've never really much liked entertainment. And so that's kind of the way the country people were. Uh, I'd rather hear somebody sit and sing something for me, even if they don't sing very well, than listen to a record of someone singing or something like that. So it's all kind of, it's all kind of dying out. We're becoming a nation that's very homogenized, I think. Do you think there's anything that could change to kind of save some of this history? Well, I hope people listening to things like this program and other programs that are similar uh, will help folk music programs. And I'm very pleased with what they're doing in Mountain View at the Folk Center. Uh, around here, that's hard. Uh, Probably the worst reception I ever had telling stories and singing was at a small town, uh, Southwest Arkansas Lions Club. Big club, lots of people there. 
But you know what it was? This reminded them of the old poor days that they were very glad to be gone from. And a lot of the a lot of the stories, as you can tell, they're they're based in a rural economy that a lot of people think, I'm so glad I don't live in that anymore, you know. I don't know. That's killing it though, I think. How do you think the urbanization of the area? I mean, there's still a lot of uh, natural, you know, protected areas, but I mean, Hot Springs is growing. The Northwest Arkansas is bustling. How do you think that's affected it? I live on a little road at Bonnerdale called Apple Road, Apple Road, Mount Moriah Road. I, my address is actually Mount Moriah Road. But when I was young, my grandmother would sit out on the porch. And if she saw a car going by and she didn't know who it was, it really worried her and bothered her. Uh, everybody up our road was kin to us or we had known them for 50 years. Then there were more people living on our little road then. There were more people in the country then than there are now. And there were a lot more kids than there are now because people had big families. But nowadays, over half of the people on the road, and I've lived there all my life, more than half of the people on the road, I don't know. I don't know who they are. They're, they moved out from Hot Springs or somewhere, and, and I don't know them. I was asking one of my cousins, who is this fellow that moved the mobile home in down here and right next to my property? And he said, well, he don't tell me his name, but you know, he's, he's been by and said hi to me. So we've, uh, people travel around, they move around a lot more. That's part of it, you know. Maxine Harris, who was the great prostitute, wrote the book, uh, Call Me Madam from Hot Springs. She said, you know, most of the people that come to my house of prostitution, while they're deacons in the First Baptist Church back home, they're respected figures, but they get somewhere they don't know anybody, they can do whatever they want to. And that's part of what's wrong, I think, with America is that we travel around so much, we're not held down to the ground by being near people that have known us all our lives. If you could take an older person from your youth and drop them in today's world, what do you think would surprise them the most? I thought about this a week, a few weeks ago. My grand, my mother would have had her 92nd birthday or 93rd, maybe a few weeks ago. And I thought about what she would think of the world today. I think one of the things she would think is we're way too interested in money. Now they were interested in money back in the depression years and before, but, uh, uh, they didn't fight for it like we do. They had a lot of life outside of making money and buying things. You know, uh, I was teaching Sunday school one time and talking about this fellow was saying, I wish my wife could quit work. And I said, well, why can't she? She said, well, how would we make our boat payment if she quit work? You know, people have gotten very interested in things in prestige and big houses, big cars, you know, and they have forgotten some of the things that really make life more pleasant, like sitting around talking and singing and stuff like that. You got a nice compliment here and a comment from Donna. She says, Terry is a wealth of knowledge of Arkansas history and folklore. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So what are some uh, things from the, the Washita Mountains, maybe uh, objects or that that would just be totally foreign to someone from the city. One thing I think about a lot is the old country store. We had several stores around Bonnerdale. There was one right by my house. And then the big store was at Bonnerdale and it's been closed for a number of years now. You have to go to Glenwood uh, if you want to go to a real grocery store from my house and it's 12 miles away. But the country store was a gathering place. People would come sit and chew tobacco and spit and whittle and, sit in front of the fire in the cold winter, you know, and it was such a gathering place. And uh, we don't have anything like that today. We've become, I remember when Hot Springs had dozens of little grocery stores around. And, you know, there's not, I don't know of any small locally owned grocery stores here in Hot Springs. And that's something that's passed away. There aren't very many places to meet and, and you know, talk to people and chat and stuff like that. I have a story about the uh, store at Bonnerdale, if you want to hear it. Let's hear it. <clears throat> One time, uh, Miss Clara Ketchum owned the store at Bonnerdale, ran the store, she and her husband, Odie. And uh, one time, this old kind of simple-minded fella came in there. And it was cold winter time, and, and uh, uh, 
he wasn't wearing a coat. And Miss Clara said, why aren't you wearing a coat? It's cold out there. He said, well, I used the outhouse. The store then just had an outhouse, didn't have indoor plumbing. I used the outhouse and my coat dropped off in the hole in the outhouse. And I was wondering, Miss Clara, do you have a long stick or something I could borrow to fish my coat out of the outhouse? And she said, well, what in the world do you want that? If it's fell down in the outhouse, that, that old coat ain't going to be worth nothing. Just leave it down in there. And he said, well, you're probably right, Miss Clara, but I had my lunch in the pocket, and so I want to get it out for that, he said. So anyway, Mr. Ketchum told me one time that their store for many years was mainly a snuff and egg trading station. Country people would bring their eggs in and their butter, maybe, and they would get... Uh, uh, they would buy snuff or other tobacco products that were very popular. There's an old lady went in the store one time and, and Mr. Ketchum said, I'm sorry to tell you, Miss Smith, the uh, price of snuff's gone way up. And she said, well, they never have charged as much for it as it's worth. She said. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing quite like that experience today. <laughs> How about one more song and then we'll see if we got any questions. Absolutely. And, and before uh, you do that, uh, just a reminder to the audience, get those questions and comments in if you have any. All of my friends that I loved yesterday gone home, gone home. The songbird that sings in the dale seems to say, Gone home, gone home. They've joined the heavenly fold. They're walking on streets of pure gold. They left one by one as their work here was done. Gone home. Gone home. Life here is lonely since they've gone before. Gone home. Gone home. The old weeping willow that stands by the door sadly sings. Gone home. They've joined the heavenly fold. They're walking on streets of pure gold. They left one by one as their work here was done. Gone home. Gone home. The trumpet will sound on that great judgment day. Gone home. Gone home. We'll see all our friends that have gone on this way. Gone home. Gone home. They've joined the heavenly fold. They're walking on streets of pure gold. They left one by one as their work here was done. Gone home. Gone home. Thank you, Paul. How's it going? All right. Got, got a couple questions. People are uh, interested in you being a lawyer. Uh, we have a question from Will, might be a relative of yours. What is the crossover between lawyering and storytelling? Well, I think uh, being a good storyteller can be kind of important to being a lawyer, especially if you're a trial lawyer. And I I have been for many years. I'm kind of semi-retired now, I'm not doing that much, but you need to be able to speak. You need to be able to tell stories. You need to not be afraid to speak. Uh, you need to not be afraid to, to make a mistake or to leave something out or, you know. I, uh, I sing at church with another fella and he's very, he's kind of a perfectionist and he wants us to practice and get it right. And I said, well, you know, if we miss a note or something, you know, what's, what's the big deal? And so I don't know, a lawyer and a storyteller both need to be outgoing and they need to listen. It took me a long time to gather all the stories. It took me all my life, really, to gather all the stories and songs that I know. So you have to be a listener and then you have to be a speaker. You have to be one who proclaims the folklore you've collected. Got a question from Eric who wants to know, what's the hardest part of being a lawyer? 
Um, I used to do a lot of custody litigation, a lot of it. One year I did 300 divorces. And you worry so about those children that are involved. You worry that you're doing all you can. You worry that you're on the right side because you sometimes get into a case and you've, you kind of begin to wonder, is my client really the best one here? So I would say the hardest part of being a lawyer with me was getting personally entangled in the case. And you do that very much in a custody case and some other kinds of cases. Yeah, and then we'd love to have you back at some point to talk about that topic as well, since you're kind of an expert in two <laughs> different fields. Um, a similar question, uh, what is the hardest part about being someone who grew up in the Washita region? Well, most of us who grew up here, at least that are my age, and I'm 64, most of us who grew up here were grew up poor. Uh, we didn't have electricity in our house till I was 11 years old. I remember taking two uh, kerosene lamps and setting one here and one here and put my book in the middle so I could read. And it was so wonderful to have that single electric light dangling down from the ceiling, that unprotected bulb. Oh, I thought what a miracle that was, you know. And so the poverty was difficult. I'm not going to lie. Poverty brought out some of the best in us, and yet it was it was difficult to deal with too. Would you say it was boring, or everyone found their own way to kind of entertain themselves? And when I was little, we lived to tune in the big old battery powered radio, big old Philco radio stood this high, you know, uh, and listen to the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday nights. And the reception wasn't always that great. My wife hates to listen to the radio if there's the least bit of static, but I grew up with that. It's no big deal. You know, we, we, sometimes it'd fade completely out, but we knew it'd come back, you know? So, uh, we weren't bored. We had all kinds of other things to do. We spent a lot of time in the woods. We spent a lot of time outside. Um, and so we were not bored, but it was just a different, different lifestyle, a different thing that kept us entertained. And do you think listening to folklore stories and songs uh, helped with that a lot too? Oh, I think so very much for me, at least. Uh, we would on a hot summer night, we'd pull our old homemade chairs out in a circle out in the yard, uncles and cousins and whoever happened to be there. And they'd tell stories and, and talk about people and who used to live here and what they did and stuff like that. And, uh, they were always down on doctors, I remember. They'd talk about and say, well, whatever happened to old John? They'd say, well, the doctors killed him. They'd say, you know. And uh, my grandmother, by the way, was kind of an herb doctor. She gathered herbs. And when I was a little bitty boy, I'd go with her and we'd dig uh, may apple root and different herbs. And people would come to our house, sometimes middle of the night, and knock on the door and ask if grandma could, you know, fix up. The baby's got the colic. Can grandma fix that, you know? And she usually would. If you could relive one memory from those days, what would you go back to? I've been thinking a lot, and I don't know why I would want to relive this, but when I was probably four years old, I decided I was going to run away from home. And Grandma sat down on the porch, and she fixed me up a bindle, like a hobo carries, you know, a stick with a little handkerchief on the, with a sandwich in the handkerchief or an apple. I don't remember what it was. And she said, all right, Terry, you, you go ahead. You can run away. Take this with you so you'll have something to eat. And she, I started walking down the road, and Grandma went inside the house, got a white sheet, and she run through the woods kind of and come out in the road ahead of me wearing that white sheet and said, boom, like that, and scared me to death. And I turned around and ran the other way. I don't know. I, I don't know how often I think about that. And then she ran back to the house and was sitting on the porch again before when I got there. But I, uh, I often think of the little tricks and the games and stuff we played. We'd play find the thimble. Somebody would hide a thimble when I was a little boy and, We'd all have to look for it, and they'd say, you're getting warmer or getting colder, you know, and you'd, you'd get closer, and eventually you'd find the thimble, you know. So I don't know. I miss a bunch of things. I'd like to relive a lot of those days. Have you ever considered writing a, a book about that? I've thought about it. I've thought about it. Uh, I've thought about writing two books, one about the folklore, my upbringing, and one about the law practice, but I'd have to wait till certain people died before I bought, wrote the law practice book. <laughs> uh, what, what could you write different chapters about on the folklore? Well, things like 
the importance of, they used to call it mother, home, and heart. And there are a lot of songs, I usually sing one of them, but I didn't tonight, about mother, you know, and and you you reverenced mother, you know. Even though women didn't have the right to vote, my grandmother never voted in her life. She didn't think women ought to vote. But uh, you reverenced mother, you know. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And your home, the home place, Nobody has a home place anymore. I do. I have a home place my family's lived on for generations, but most people, that doesn't mean anything to them, you know. It's just a piece of land, so much an acre, you know. And uh, those are, uh, those were very important, and they're not so much anymore, I think. Food was an important issue, and uh, we loved food. Simple food, you know, was very important. Um, we always thought poor folks were a little bit superior to rich folks, you know. I remember my Uncle William would say when I'd been to college, you know, and come back, and I thought I was pretty special, and I'd do something stupid, you know, that a country boy shouldn't know how to do. And Uncle William would say, boy, was you raised in a hotel? <laughs> That's kind of a, a gotcha to the <laughs> old, old cliche. Um, Religion was very important. And, you know, I, one of my cousins, who's not now very religious at all, he used to never miss church. And I said, well, why did you always go to church? You don't seem to be religious now. And he said, well, there wasn't anything else to do on a Sunday. And that's where you'd see everybody, you know. It was just a gathering place. And I, I fear that that may be at least partially true. So uh, just another example of how important gathering places were. Yeah. I mean, what were the, the populations and the, the demographics of ages and generations like in these small towns growing up like Bonnerdale? Well, I think I think there were a good many old people, but there were a lot more young people then than there are now. People had big families. My mother was one of eight children. Her daddy was one of 11 children. And, you know, everybody had five or six kids. And uh, we don't have many kids anymore. Back then, you needed the kids. They worked around the farm. They did a lot of the uh, simple farm work and they were a, a help to you instead of being a drain on your pocketbook. So that was some of the demographics. Now we were, where I'm from, there was, it was all white people. There weren't any blacks back then. And uh, uh, there were some Hispanics that moved in. And at first they were kind of suspicious of them because we, we were always suspicious of Roman Catholics. You know, they were different and we didn't, you know, want to have anything to do with them. And somebody found this first family of Hispanics that moved into the Barnardale area Someone, uh, one of the old ladies, her car had a flat and these Hispanics helped her to change the tire and she found out they were Seventh-day Adventists. They weren't Catholics. And so they were, they were fine after that, you know. And so uh, we were a very uniform community. My mother first saw a black person when she came to Hot Springs when she was like 12 years old. She had never seen a black person before. And so we were a very, and I'm not sure that's a good thing, but I mean, we were very uniform. We were very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know. We kind of talked earlier about what you think modern society could learn from folklore. If there was something you think people of the, the Washita region could have learned from the city folk, would, would that have been one of them, diversity? Is there anything else you can think of? Well, we didn't value, the country people didn't value education nearly enough, I don't think. Um, in fact, they kind of make fun of you if you wanted to read a lot and interested in books and stuff. And I think that was harmful to them. I think they would have been a lot better off if they had had a wider view of, of life that they could learn from, from as you say, city people. But uh, I think there's a lot that's that's gone that the country people could have taught the city people and haven't anymore. One of the things I worry about is if we have another depression or something, we did pretty good in the depression because we had a big garden, had chickens, you know, that sort of thing. If we have another depression, what are people going to do? They don't know how to do anything anymore. You know, they know how to run the TV and the VCR or whatever, and but they don't know how to raise a tomato very well. Earlier, we talked about how paint was the word for ghosts. Are there any other vocabulary words like that you can teach us? Oh, I've, re I've researched that a little bit. Uh, like, for instance, uh, I was at church in Amity one time, and my son, Will, I think you've met Will, 
Will was a little baby and he was in the nursery and we were up in the church and, and the lady that kept the nursery came to me and says, if he gets ill, I'll come let you know. And my wife and I looked at each other, ill, is he going to get ill? And I learned that in South Arkansas, ill means what we in the Washington mountains would call cranky. And she meant if he gets ill, she meant if he gets cranky, I'll come let you know, I'll come get you. And so that's a difference. I mean, that's a difference of 10 miles and the expression that was commonly used was different. And there's some other of those too. I, I sort of think Highway 70 is a dividing line between the Washtenaw Mountains and the Flatlands. And it's true there are some mountains south of that and there's some flatlands north of it, but uh, you know, it's settled by a little bit different people. You know, my family were union veterans and the mountain people were a lot more union veterans. The, Flatlanders were all Confederate veterans, I think, for the most part. And so there were some differences going back like that. Well, uh, we've got time for one more song or short story, if you'd like to tell one. And I've got just a couple final questions after that. So, Well, let me see what I can find. We'll do a Mother Home and Heart song, since I didn't do one earlier. <laughs> There's an old and faded picture on the wall It's been hanging there for many, many a year It's the picture of my mother And I know there is no other That can take the place of mother on the wall On the wall, on the wall How I love that dear old picture on the wall Time is quickly passing by and I bow my head and cry, but I know I'll meet my mother after all. It's been years since she left me all alone, and I have a little family of my own, and I know I love them well more than any tongue can tell. But I'll hold that dear old picture on the wall On the wall, on the wall How I love that dear old picture on the wall Time is quickly passing by And I bow my head and cry But I'll hold that dear old picture on the wall Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me tonight. Absolutely. Well, I've got one more uh, question for you. What are some resources, maybe books, documentaries, movies, where people can learn more about folklore if they wish? There's some excellent books, and there's some that are they're hard to find that are very good for Arkansas folklore and history. One is my friend, the late Tate C. Page, book called The Voices of Moccasin Creek. It's fabulous, and it's set in the foothills of the Ozarks, but it's it's just every bit like the life I grew up with. Another one is is a book that has a lot more connection to this part of the world called Garden Sass. And it's kind of an Arkansas uh, version of uh, the Fo Foxfire books. The Foxfire books are excellent resources as well. And even though they're all set in the Appalachians, and by the way, if you ever live back east, it's Appalachian, not Appalachian. They'll tell you real quick. But uh, it's set in the Appalachians, but it's very similar to uh, the old timey lifestyles that we had here. So those are three I would recommend. The first two are hard to get a hold of. Uh, you have to get on used books uh, online and, and you might can can find them. But uh, and I'm sure there are lots of uh, there are lots of others. But those are three really good ones that have influenced me a lot. All right. Well, thank you, everyone in the audience for watching. Um, we do, anyone still watching live, we have another event tomorrow night with Dr. Jean Shelby, who is the uh, Garland County Health Secretary, and we're going to have an update on COVID-19, so have questions for that ready. And uh, Terry, it was a pleasure having you. I hope to invite you back for maybe in a couple months. We can do something on law, and I know you have tons of material you didn't cover tonight, so love to have you back in the future. Thanks for having me, Paul. Good Absolutely. Have a good night.